450 million years ago, the Earth had become a less violent planet. It was no longer being bombarded by giant meteors from space. The great ice ages had passed. Nothing yet lived on the land, but in the warm and shallow seas which fringed the continents, there was a rich diversity of life. Fish had not yet evolved jaws, so these Arendapsis, the distant ancestors of terrestrial life, remained close to the coast where they could feed. Segmented creatures, the trilobites had diversified into many species. But deep beneath the Earth's crust, mighty forces were still shaping the planet. Just beneath the surface, the mantle is made up from molten rock, which moves slowly with the force of gravity. The movement is both circular as well as vertical. This convection drives the restless drifting of the continents. Over millions of years, the continents were forced toward each other. The waters of the Iapsus Sea began to vanish, the life within driven by inexorable forces. Oceans are drained as the land masses collide. But the waters move elsewhere, and so new environments are born. Continents move very slowly, but over millions of years, the changes are dramatic. But not only were the continents being forced to change, life was also modifying its shape. An arms race had begun. In the French National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Daniel Gouget has studied this period of prehistory and the armored and predatory fish that had evolved. 410 million years ago, giant predators were hunting the oceans. These creatures had developed a new and mighty weapon, the jaw. With the invention of the jaw, you get to a new possibility for the animal to become a predator. They have a unique skeletal structure that does not exist in any fish today. The front part of its body was shielded in hard, armor-like bones. Instead of teeth, they had bony plates in their mouths, which acted like a pair of razor-sharp scissors. With strong jaws, the placoderms dominated the seas of the Devonian period. They were like armored sharks. Our early ancestors had no chance against predators like these. The Ostatians were there, but they were absolutely uh, under the dominance of these placoderms, which were adapted to all kinds of environment. They represent about uh, 75 to 80 percent of the vertebrates you find in the Devonian. So our uh, Ostatian ancestors were certainly in the shadow of the placoderms because 
they couldn't develop. Over millions of years, the jawless fish, Arandaspis, had become extinct. But one of the fish that had evolved was this, called Eusthenopteron. Science knows it as one of the lobed finned fishes. And this one was the stepping stone to the creatures which would eventually come to walk on land. It was a good swimmer, but could not compete with the placoderms, so it had to seek alternatives. Life was now becoming a series of strategies, both for predator and prey. Strategies that were sometimes dictated by the Earth itself. The clues are in the rocks and the history of the continents as they shift. The fossil record now is widely scattered, but when we move back in time, the sites move together to where the creatures once lived in that ancient sea. The interior of this continent was empty, a dry desert with no life. But when the continents clashed, the force threw up a great mountain range. We know it as the Caledonian Mountains. The northernmost site of those ancient mountains are in Norway, here at Sonjefjord. The folds and curves in the rocks can only hint at the forces which are at work in the earth. At the point of collision, solid rock can bend and twist as the massive forces at work blend one vast landmass with the next. When the ancient continents of Baltica and Laurentia met, they shaped the hard rocks as if they were putty in the hands of a potter. This sinuous rock formation is known by geologists as a fold. Here is another part of those vanished mountains at Monreith Bay in Scotland. 430 million years ago, these twisted and tortured rocks, folding over and upon each other, were also part of the shoreline of the Aptis Sea. The southern tip of the collision is in the east of the United States. This too was once a part of the Caledonian Range. The strata folds its way for thousands of miles from the USA to Norway. But of greater interest to prehistorians is what happened when the Caledonian Mountains were forced up, when the ancient Iaptis Sea was drained and the rich diversity of life it sheltered was abruptly forced to seek alternatives. The Earth may seem a permanent place, but it is restless and responsive to the forces that surge beneath its surface. The formation of continents, seas, and mountain ranges take millions of years, but the power is awesome. Mountains were forced up for over 40 million years. Geologists believe that some of the peaks were almost as high as Mount Everest. But what is intriguing is that many fossils of those creatures, which were our early ancestors, are found where the foothills of the Caledonian Range once stood. 
The moisture-laden winds are halted by the peaks. They rise and cool. Then rain falls in torrents. Parts of the sea were moved inland. They became rivers, and then where the country flattened, the water spread out to become freshwater lakes. New environments were created, new frontiers to challenge life. Some plant life had evolved, but its grip on the land was tenuous. Often the land was bone dry. And when it rained, the force of the rushing water would erode the soil, taking with it the mosses and ferns which struggled to grow. The lakes, when they were tranquil, must have been inviting environments just out of reach. But life itself took a part in the opening up of these new freshwater habitats. The rock face alongside this river was once the edge of an ancient freshwater lake. 370 million years ago, this was at the foothills of the ancient Caledonian Range. Today, it's called Red Hill in the state of Pennsylvania. This was the site of one of the earliest known forests. These leaves are from the earliest known trees on the planet, which spread their branches and changed the world. The tree is called Archaeopteris. Scientists think that it was not unlike today's conifers, the pines and larches with thin needle-like leaves. They had roots which spread wide and deep and would help bind the soil when the floods came. Like today's trees, the trunk thickened with every year of growth and scientists believe that it may have grown as tall as 20 meters, just over 60 feet. What it gave to life was shelter from the sun. Dr. Stephen Sheckler has studied the impact that Archaeopteris had, both upon the environment and the life that was in lakes and swamps. This is a good-sized Archaeopter stump. Uh -huh. It's uh, the kind that's pretty typical for the trees of this time. Yeah, that'd be 25 centimeters. 25 centimeters, okay. Yeah. So, that's another big one. Then we've got some small ones here. Exactly, yeah. Should I slide back to here now? Yeah, that's a good idea. By marking the fossil stumps, he and his students can then work out how dense this ancient forest may have been. This young forest behind us, I think, is actually a very close analog to the appearance of what the first Archaeopteris forest would have looked like. Trees with white bark that are bare now would have been about the size of the early Archaeopteris. So the whole ecosystem was transformed by the introduction of Archaeopteris. What previously had been an open environment with relatively low primary productivity became a closed canopy environment with much higher rate of productivity. But there was another modification to the environment which, while perhaps subtle, was profound. Well, the main things that change, I think, are the, the shade. Uh, all the earlier plants 
in the middle Devonian and even at the beginning of the late Devonian, uh, except for Archaeopteris, uh, have leaves that are very delicate and very fine pieces so that they do not make shade. Uh, this is important because the streams that are going through the area would have been kept warm because of sunlight. Uh, also, the trees that existed before then shed very few parts, so the amount of litter that could accumulate and wash into the streams was very little. Archaeopteris not only made a big leafy crown with lots of shade, which is a good environment for early animals to crawl out onto the land, but also they provide through the dropped pieces enormous amounts of organic carbon into the ecosystem that just was not there before. This was the first forest canopy to provide shade and shelter. These trees spread their pine-like needles and provided protection helped the soil to retain moisture, which in turn would help other plant communities. They helped change the landscape. Their influence didn't stop on land. Archaeopteris grew along the lake shores and helped change this environment too. Archaeopteris shed their branches which then fell into the water, would eventually become waterlogged and sink to the lake floor. They would decay, their nutrients would be leached out into the lake waters so that the trees provided both food and shelter for the fish. The fossil record shows that our distant ancestors moved into lake environments at around the same time as the predators. There were still challenges, but one of them would help life to make the next great step on the miracle planet. In the world today, mountains still play their part in shaping the land as well as the life that lives on it. In South America, the Amazon rainforest needs the waters that run off the mountains after rain. The deluges of the wet season spread out through the rainforest, one of the richest ecosystems on Earth. When the forest is flooded, it provides nutrients and shelter for an amazing diversity of fish life. The armored pleco looks almost prehistoric. While the predatory arowana glides through the sunken forest. So frequent is the flooding that the trees have also adapted to spending much of their lives inundated. They provide both food and shelter to help sustain the rich variety of life. The muddy waters of the Amazon and other rainforest rivers perhaps can give us a glimpse of what life might have been like when it adapted to fresh water. The Amazon does not remain flooded all through the year. After the wet season, the sun begins to wield its power. By June, the waters dry up and can drop in some places by as much as 18 meters, almost 60 feet. And when it does drop, there are winners and losers. As the water becomes hot, there is little oxygen for the fish, so they flounder on the surface desperately trying to take gulps of air. But there is none to be had, so they die to become food for the scavengers. Yet around them, Oxygen is everywhere. Scientists believe that 370 million years ago, the world would have experienced similar shifts in the annual climate. And 
Yet again, the trees played their part. While their fallen branches gave shelter, the bacteria contributing to this breakdown consumed oxygen, thus depleting the levels in the water. Today in the Amazon and elsewhere, there are fish that can handle this the lungfish, relics from the past that are able to take oxygen as normal fish do from the water. But they can also breathe air. And when the Amazon dries up, this fish will survive, often buried in wet mud, breathing as we do, with lungs. Recent research shows that lungfish are close relatives to our distant ancestors who lived in the shallows when the first forests took root on land. Dr. Per Alberg has studied Euthanopteron, and he believes that our distant ancestor had lungs like the lungfish of today. The lungfish is moved into a freshwater swamp environment at the same time as the earliest tetrapods and right alongside them. We find them together in the same strata. So when we look at modern-day lungfishes and how their respiration works, what we're looking at is probably something that's closely convergent onto early tetrapods. Lungs evolved in all likelihood to help the animal to breathe when living in warm, tropical waters with a low oxygen content. This is the way science believes early fish developed lungs. First, the upper part of the esophagus, the airway, swelled and formed the precursor of a lung. Moving from the sea into the fresh water made this become larger. The inner surface was covered with capillary vessels to absorb more oxygen, which was essential for survival in those early lakes. If lungs had not been present in our ancestors, there is no way that our ancestors, ancestors would have made it to become truly competent terrestrial animals. We would still be flopping around in the shallows today. Modern fish are the descendants of those early lungfish. But the lung of the modern fish is no longer used for breathing. Instead, it has evolved into an air bladder, which helps it keep its equilibrium when it changes depth in the water. Most of the ancient fish that stayed in the ocean did not develop lungs, so they eventually became extinct. 